So, jetzt kommen wir zu unserer zweiten Dame hier am Vortrag. Sie kommt ursprünglich aus Australien, deswegen wird dieser Vortrag in Englisch gehalten. Jetzt ist sie tätig an der Uni Freiburg am Bernstein Center und ihr Vortrag heißt From a Kip to a Bang, Pulling Together the Big Bang Theory. Einen herzlichen Applaus für Sarah Jarvis. So good evening, uh, as, as you heard, my name's Sarah, and I work in a field called computational neuroscience. Now usually when people hear this, they get the idea that I work on something like this. The electronic computer brain, it adds, it subtracts, it's fun at parties. <laughs> Or better yet, something like this, which would actually be kind of cool. Anyway, the truth sounds, it sounds more like science fiction than medicine. But as I'm going to explain, computational neuroscience is a really nice method we have of trying to understand what's happening in the brain and also what's happening when the brain gets a disease. So if you put big brain theory into Google, you'll pretty soon come across this guy, Albert Einstein, the father of relativity, the greatest genius of the 20th century, never had to buy a hairbrush. <laughs> and less than seven hours after he died, medical doctors removed his brain because they wanted to see whether there was something special about it that could explain why Einstein came up with all these really great ideas. And here it is. And if you look at Einstein's brain under a microscope, then what you'll find is that his brain is not so different from everybody else's in this room, in that it's made up of nerve cells. And each nerve cell is a really simple unit that just sends and receives signals to other nerve cells. And together they form this really complex network that we know as the brain. Now, what they found with Einstein's brain was that the size of it and the number of nerve cells was the same for most other people, but that there seemed to be more connections. And the question that they asked was, is this important? And the answer was, they couldn't say. And the reason for this is that the brain's a really difficult thing to study. So normally, when we want to find out how something works, what we can do is say, like a car, we can have the car, We can open up the lid, we can see the engine, we can see how all the different parts are working together. And if we want, we can even throw some of the, turn it off and throw some of the parts out. Because we know we can always put them back in together and then we'll have a working car and we'll be happy because we've understood something about how the car works. Great, right? If we want to try and apply the same logic to work out how, say, the brain of a cat works, well, usually if you tell a cat this, it will do this. But say you manage to convince the cat that this is a really good idea. <laughs> well, it, and then you have to open up the brain. So two things are going to happen. The first is you're going to have a very unhappy cat followed very closely by a very non-working cat. <laughs> and then, of course, you're unhappy too because you still haven't understood anything about the brain. And this is a problem that we often have in biology. How can you study a system that you just can't stop? So for neuroscientists, what we try and do is we try and find a way that we can look at the brain. So there are things like magnetic resonance imaging, which are these really big machines that you see in all the medical dramas. But we see brain areas with those, not individual nerve cells. So instead, what we can do is, uh, if we have our brain here, what we can do is, is we use another technique, which is actually one of the oldest techniques that we have. And that is to take a needle and stick it in the brain. Ooh, it sounds bad, but it works. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, so if we do that, we can record from one individual nerve cell. And if we take two needles, we can record from two nerve cells. And I never knew that neuroscience was that funny. It's great. So if we have two different signals, we can look at how much interaction there is between these two signals. And we can work out how much these cells are talking to each other. There's a problem with this too, though. And that is that when we first started using this technique, we could record from tens of nerve cells. Now we can record from hundreds, if not thousands, of nerve cells. But the human brain contains 100,000 million nerve cells. That's a lot. And we don't have that many needles. <laughs> At least I don't. So we're always going to have this problem that we won't be able to see the entire system that we want to. So to go back to our, our original question, we have to ask, how can we find out how things work if we can only see part of it at the one time? Now, this is a problem that many scientists face, regardless of what they're studying, and it's possible to solve. Because, in fact, all of us have this problem every single day. Whenever you have a new system, you have to work out how it works. And, in fact, when I first came to Germany from Australia, 
I had this problem because there was a system here that was so complex I couldn't work it out. And I'm not talking about my Steuererklärung. <laughs> I'm talking about football. Now, if you've never seen a football game, like because in Australia we don't play football that much, as some of you may have noticed last year, <laughs> it was so embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, so if you've never seen a football game before, then it looks like quite a weird thing. It's just men running around in shorts. <laughs> Not that I have a problem with that. So the best chance that you have of understanding how the game works is to go and sit in a stadium, find a good spot, perhaps take your binoculars, and then you can see not only what's happening where the ball is, but also what's happening elsewhere on the field. But perhaps you can't do that. So the next best option that you have is to actually sit home and watch it on TV. And this is okay, but if you've noticed, the TV camera only ever follows the ball, so you can't see what's happening elsewhere on the field. But if you watch a game for 90 minutes, you'll soon work out the basics. Like, there's two goals, you can only kick the ball, and if you're Italian, you cry a lot. <laughs> that is a rule, right? It should be a rule. Okay, so now we, we, we have the basic rules of football, even if some of them aren't proper. So if we wanted to, if, if, if I said to somebody, say, you guys up there, hi, can you build me a model now of football? You might go away and build me something like this. And this is a good model, right? It has all the basic rules. But it's not a great model. Because football isn't about the basic rules or how you kick the ball. It's about the dynamics and the interaction of a team. And this is something that you can't just capture. So instead, we have to try and work out a better way. So for us trying to understand the, the, the brain using our needles, it's rather like us trying to, uh, like we have our, instead of having, we're watching it at home on the TV camera, but instead of the TV camera following the ball, with our needles, we're each following an individual player and nothing else. Now this might not sound very hopeful, but if we're really clever and we pick a good player and then we follow him for different games and different interactions, we'll soon work out how he plays as part of the team. We might do this for several players, and then we find out that there's different roles and different styles of play. So f perhaps we have something like a midfielder, like this guy here, and he plays not only with the players near him, but also those far away as well. Or we might find that there's another type of player that only interacts with those really nearby. And then if we put these, these two types of players together, we can have different styles of play. So if we want to be like Yogi, because who doesn't? Hello. We might start off with this kind of team. And what we see is that the ball's going back and forth too much because these yellow guys are just kicking it all over the place. So instead, we swap some of these players for the blue ones. And then we have a very different style of game, and then Yogi is happy. <laughs> so now that we've understood something about interactions, if I came back to you guys, hi again, and I said, OK, now that we, we know this, can you build me a better model, something a little bit more high tech? You might go away and build me something like this. And I'll say, that's really great. Well done. And then I'll go home and play on my PS3. <laughs> and don't be fooled, because these games are really fun to play, not because of how good the graphics are, but because of how realistic the computer players are. They interact just like a real footballer would. So now we have our model of the brain or of a football g game, and we ha didn't have to record from every single nerve cell or every single player. And we know that we can change the style of game by changing what we, what we have in our team. So how does that help us to understand the brain or disease? Hmm. So as it happens, I have two uncles, Bob and Bob. <laughs> My grandparents weren't very original. Anyway, so it's actually quite sad. You shouldn't laugh. Because first, Bob has Alzheimer's disease, which is a type of epilepsy. And second, Bob, sorry, type of epilepsy, dementia. I've got dementia too, apparently. So second, Bob has epilepsy. And what we find, oh no, what we find is that if we go back to this, if we just look at the brain, we'll see that there are physical changes. But these physical changes, like that there's less nerve cells, don't always explain why we see these symptoms that we find. And this is where computer models are really useful. So if we go back to this metaphor of the brain being like a football game, then a healthy brain would be like a really big team on a really big field. So for Alzheimer's, Bob, what we see is that some of the team just haven't shown up because they're dead. 
It's sad, I know. So even worse, though, is that some of the plays have become really lazy. They've turned from yellow to blue. So what this means for the game is that it makes, takes, it takes a much longer time to get from here to here. From, sorry, from here to here. So we have to make lots of little passes instead of one or two big kicks because we have less of these yellow players. And so what happens is that the team stops playing as one big unified team and starts to break away into smaller groups. And this is exactly what we see for Alzheimer's patients. The different areas of their brains stop communicating with each other so effectively. Now, for, meanwhile, for epilepsy, Bob, what we see is that some of the players have also uh, not shown up because they're dead. But even worse is this, that before the game, some of the players have had too much Coke. <laughs> I'm talking about the soft drink, by the way. <laughs> Berlin. So it's these ones here. And what we find is that they're now really excitable because of the sugar content. <laughs> and they're making a lot of mistakes. So they're kicking when they shouldn't. And this is bad enough. But even worse is for the healthy players who are standing right next to them. Because they're seeing these kicks. And they're not sure what's a real signal or not. So now they're responding more than they should do too. So now we have a much more excitable game. And one in which false signals can spread very quickly throughout the network. Now, it may sound like, like these models aren't giving us anything new about the brain, but that's not the case. So remember that I said that we, we don't know everything about the brain. We can't see everything. So we know that some nerve cells have died, and some nerve cells have become more excitable. But we don't know exactly how many of each. And this is where a computer model is beautiful. We can just test them out. So say we have two teams, and we're not sure which one best represents a brain with epilepsy. So what we can do is we can just see how good they are. And we see how good they are exactly as we would for a normal team, which is to just look at their game statistics. And because we have the game statistics for a real brain with epilepsy, we can compare. And perhaps we find that this one gives us the better fit. And then we can identify this team as being the correct model or a good representation of a brain with epilepsy. And this is really important because if we can identify this team as being a good one, then we have a much better chance of working out how to get it back to playing like a healthy, to, sorry, to playing like a healthy team. And this is something that we can't do just by knowing the basic rules. So to answer this question of what good are models within neuroscience, it's this. They allow us to see how individual nerve cells work together while the brain is in motion and to test out different configurations to see what's going on when the brain is playing badly but also when it wins the World Cup. Thank you very much.